to a mountain by henry kendall read for LibriVox.org by peter tucker to thee o father of the stately peaks above me in the loftier light to thee imperial brother of those awful hills whose feet are set in splendid spheres of flame whose heads are where the gods are and whose sides of strength are belted round with all the zones of all the world i dedicate these songs and if within the compass of this book there lives and glows one verse in which there beats the pulse of wind and torrent if one line is here that like a running water sounds and seems an echo from the lands of leaf be sure that line is thine here in this home away from men and books and all the schools i take thee for my teacher in thy voice of deathless majesty i kneeling hear god's grand authentic gospel year by year the great sublime cantata of thy storm strikes through my spirit fills it with a life of startling beauty thou my bible art with holy leaves of rock and flower and tree and moss and shining runnel from each page that helps to make thy awful volume i have learned a noble lesson in the psalm of thy grave winds and in the liturgy of singing waters lo my soul has heard the higher worship and from thee indeed the broad foundations of a finer hope were gathered in and thou hast lifted up the blind horizon for a larger faith moreover walking in exalted woods of naked glory in the green and gold of forest sunshine i have paused like one with all the life transfigured and a flood of light ineffable has made me feel as felt the grand old prophets caught away by flames of inspiration but the words sufficient for the story of my dream are far too splendid for poor human lips but thou to whom i turn with reverent eyes o stately father whose majestic face shines far above the zone of wind and cloud where high dominion of the morning is thou hast the song complete of which my songs are pallid adumbrations certain sounds of strong authentic sorrow in this book may have the sob of upland torrents these and only these may touch the great world's heart for lo they are the issues of that grief which makes a man more human and his life more like that frank exalted life of thine but in these pages there are other tones in which thy large superior voice is not through which no beauty that resembles thine has ever shone these are the broken words of blind occasions when the world has come between me and my dream no song is here of mighty compass for my singing robes i've worn in stolen moments all my days have been the days of a laborious life and ever on my struggling soul has burned the fierce heat of this hurried sphere but thou to whose fair majesty i dedicate my book of rhymes thou hast the perfect rest which makes the heaven of the highest gods to thee the noises of this violent time are far faint whispers and from age to age within the world and yet apart from it thou standest round thy lordly capes the sea rolls on with a superb indifference for ever in thy deep green gracious glens the silver fountains sing for ever far above dim ghosts of waters in the caves the royal robe of morning on thy head abides for ever evermore the wind is thy august companion and thy peers are cloud and thunder and the face sublime of blue mid-heaven on thy awful brow is deity and in that voice of thine there is the great imperial utterance of god for ever and thy feet are set where evermore through all the days and years there rolls the grand hymn of the deathless wave end of poem this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mary Rivers by Henry Kendall Read for LibriVox.org by Peter Tucker Path beside the silver waters Flashing in October's sun Walk by green and golden margins Where the sister streamlets run Twenty shining springs have vanished Full of flower and leaf and bird since the step of merry rivers in your lawny dell was heard twenty white-haired junes have left us grey with frost and bleak with gale since the hand of her we loved so plucked the blossoms in your dale twenty summers twenty autumns from the grand old hills have passed with their robes of royal colour 
since we saw the darling last morning comes the blessed morning and the slow song of the sea like a psalm from radiant altars floats across a rose-red lea then the fair strong noonday blossoms and the reaper seeks the cool valley of the moss and myrtle and the glimmering water pool noonday flames and evening follows and the lordly mountains rest heads arrayed with tenfold splendour on the rich heart of the west evening walks with moon and music where the higher life has been but the face of merry rivers there will never more be seen ah when autumn dells are dewy and the wave is very still and that grey ghost called the twilight passes from the distant hill even in the hallowed nightfall when the fathers sit and dream and the splendid rose of heaven sees a sister in the stream often do i watch the waters gleaming in a starry bay thinking of a bygone beauty and a season far away musing on the grace that left us in a time of singing rain on the lady who will never walk amongst these heaths again four there were but two were taken and this darling we deplore she was sweetest of the circle she was dearest of the four in the daytime and the dew time comes the phantom of her face none will ever sit where she did none will ever fill her place with the passing of our mary like a sunset out of sight passed away our pure first passion all its life and all its light all that made the world a dreamland all the glory and the glow of the fine fresh morning feeling vanished twenty years ago girl whose strange unearthly beauty haunts us ever in our sleep many griefs have worn our hearts out we are now too tired to weep time has tried us years have changed us but the sweetness shed by you falls upon our spirits daily like divine immortal dew shining are our thoughts about you of the blossoms past recall you are still the rose of lustre still the fairest of them all in the sleep that brings the garland gathered from the bygone hours you are still our merry rivers still the queen of all the flowers let me ask where none can hear me when you passed into the shine and you heard a great love calling did you know that it was mine in your life of light and music tell me did you ever see shining in a holy silence what was as a flame in me ah oh, my darling no one saw it purer than untrodden dew was that first unhappy passion buried in the grave with you bird and leaf will keep the secret wind and wood will never tell men the thing that i have whispered mary rivers fare you well end of poem this librivox recording is in the public domain kingsborough by henry kendall read for librivox.org by peter tucker a waving of hats and of hands the voices of thousands in one a shout from the ring and the stands and a glitter of heads in the sun they are off they are off is the roar as the cracks settle down to the race with the yellow and black to the fore and the panic blood forcing the pace at the back of the course and away where the running ground home again wheels grub travels in front on the bay with a featherweight hard at his heels but yeomans you see is about and the wily new zealander waits though the high-blooded flyer is out whose rider and colours are tates look ashworth comes on with a run to the head of the levity colt and the fleet the magnificent son of panic is shooting his bolt hurrah for the weather bit strain a fireworks is first in the strait and a kelpie will win it again is the roar from the ring to the gate the leader must have it but no for see full of running behind a beautiful wonderful foe with the speed of the thunder and wind a flashing of whips and a cry and ashworth sits down on his horse with kingsborough's head at his thigh and the field scattered over the course in a clamour of calls and acclaim the pair race away from the ruck the horse to the last of it game a marvel of muscle and pluck but the foot of the sappho is there and kingston's invincible strength and the numbers go up in the air the colt is the first by a length the first and the favourite too the terror that came from his stall with the spirit of fire and of dew to show the road home to them all 
from the back of the field to the straight he has come as is ever his wont and carried his welter-like weight like a tradesman right through to the front nor wonder at cheering a wit for this is the popular horse that never was beaten when fit by any four hoofs on the course to starter for ledger or cup has he ever shown feather of fear when saddle and rider were up and the case to be argued was clear no rather the questionless pluck of the blood unaccustomed to yield preferred to spread eagle the ruck and make a long tail of the field bear witness ye lovers of sport to races of which he can boast when flyer by flyer was caught and beaten by lengths on the post lo this is the beautiful bay of many the marvellous one who showed us last season the way that a ledger should always be won there was something to look at and learn ye shrewd irreproachable touts when the panic colt tired at the turn and the thing was all over but shouts ay that was the spin when the twain came locked by the bend of the course the zealander pulling his rein and the veteran hard on his horse when ashworth was riding twas late for his friends to applaud on the stands and the sappho colt entered the straight with the race of the year in his hands just look at his withers his thighs and the way that he carries his head has richmond more wonderful eyes or melbourne that spring in his tread the grand the intelligent glance from a spirit that fathoms and feels makes the heart of a horse lover dance till the warm-blooded life in him reels what care have i ever to know his owner by sight or by name the horse that i glory in so is still the magnificent same i own i am proud of the pluck of the sportsman that never was bought but the nag that spread eagled the ruck is bound to be first in my thought for who that has masculine flame or who that is thorough at all can help feeling joy in the fame of this king of the kings of the stall what odds if assumption has sealed his soulless hereafter abode so long as he shows to his field the gleam of his hoofs and the road End of poem. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Beyond Kerguelen by Henry Kendall, read for LibriVox.org by Peter Tucker. Down in the south, by the waste without sail on it, far from the zone of the blossom and tree, lieth with winter and whirlwind and wail on it, ghost of a land by the ghost of a sea weird is the mist from the summit to base of it sun of its heaven is wizened and grey phantom of life is the light on the face of it never is night on it never is day here is the shore without flower or bird on it here is no litany sweet of the springs only the haughty harsh thunder is heard on it only the storm with the roar in its wings shadow of moon is the moon in the sky of it wan as the face of a wizard and far never there shines from the firmament high of it grace of the planet or glory of star all the year round in the place of white days on it all the year round where there never is night lies a great sinister bitter blind haze on it growth that is neither of darkness nor light wild is the cry of the sea in the caves by it sea that is smitten by spears of the snow desolate songs are the songs of the waves by it down in the south where the ships never go storm from the pole is the singer that sings to it hymns of the land at the planet's grey verge thunder discloses dark wonderful things to it thunder and rain and the dolorous surge hills with no hope of a wing or a leaf on them scarred with the chronicles written by flame stare through the gloom of inscrutable grief on them down on the horns of the gulfs without name cliffs with the records of fierce flying fires on them loom over perilous pits of eclipse alps with anathema stamped in the spires on them out by the wave with a curse on its lips never is sign of soft beautiful green on it never the colour the glory of rose neither the fountain nor river is seen on it naked its crags are and barren its snows blue as the face of the drowned is the shore of it shore with the capes of indefinite cave strange is the voice of its wind and the roar of it startles the mountain and hushes the wave out to the south and away to the north of it spectral and sad are the spaces untold 
all the year round a great cry goeth forth of it sob of this leper of lands in the cold no man hath stood all its bleak bitter years on it fall of a foot on its wastes is unknown only the sound of the hurricane's spears on it breaks with the shout from the uttermost zone blind are its bays with the shadow of bale on them storms of the nadir their rocks have uphurled earthquake hath registered deeply its tale on them tale of distress from the dawn of the world there are the gaps with the surges that seethe in them gaps in whose jaws is a menace that glares there the wan reefs with the merciless teeth in them gleam on a chaos that startles and scares back in the dawn of this beautiful sphere on it land of the dolorous desolate face beamed the blue day and the bountiful year on it fostered the leaf and the blossom of grace grand were the lights of its midsummer noon on it mornings of majesty shone on its seas glitter of star and the glory of moon on it fell in the march of the musical breeze valleys and hills with the whisper of wing in them dells of the daffodil spaces impearled flowered and flashed with the splendour of spring in them back in the morn of this wonderful world soft were the words that the thunder then said to it said to this lustre of emerald plain sun brought the yellow the green and the red to it sweet were the songs of its silvery rain voices of water and wind in the bays of it lingered and lulled like the psalm of a dream fair were the nights and effulgent the days of it moon was in shadow and shade in the beam summer's chief throne was the marvellous coast of it home of the spring was its luminous lee garden of glitter but only the ghost of it moans in the south by the ghost of a sea End of poem. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Black Lizzie by Henry Kendall. Read for LibriVox.org by Algie Pug. The gloved and jewelled bards who sing of Pippa, Maud, and Dorothea have hardly done the handsome thing for you, my inky Cytherea flower of a land whose sunny skies are like the dome of dante's climb they might have praised your lips your eyes and eke your ankles in their rhyme but let them pass to right your wrong aspasia of the ardent south your poet means to sing a song with some prolixity of mouth i'll even sketch you as you are in herrick's style of carelessness not overstocked with things that bar an ample view to wit with dress you have your blanket it is true but then if i am right at all what best would suit a dame like you was worn by eve before the fall indeed the fashion is a thing that never cramped your cornless toes your single jewel is a ring slung in your penetrated nose I can't detect the flowing lines of Grecian features in your face, nor are there patent any signs that link you with the Roman race. In short, I do not think your mould resembles, with its knobs of bone, the fair Hellenic shapes of old, whose perfect forms survive in stone. Still, if the charm called beauty lies in ampleness of ear and lip, and nostrils of exceeding size, you are a gem my ladyship here squatting by the doubtful flame of three poor sticks without a roof above your head impassive dame you live on somewhat hunger proof the current scandals of the day don't trouble you you seem to take things in the coolest sort of way and wisest for you have no ache you smoke a pipe of course you do about an inch in length or less which from a sexual point of view mars somehow your attractiveness but rather than resign the weed you'd shock us whites by chewing it for etiquette is not indeed a thing that bothers you a bit your people take them as a whole are careless on the score of grace and hence you needn't comb your poll or decorate your unctuous face still seeing that a little soap would soften an excess of tint you'll pardon my advance i hope in giving you a gentle hint 
you have your lovers dusky beau not made of the poetic stuff that sports an apollonian nose and wears a sleek byronic cuff but rather of a rougher clay unmixed with overmuch romance far better at the wildwood fray than spinning in a ballroom dance these scarcely are the sonneteers that sing their loves in faultless clothes your friends have more decided ears and more capaciousness of nose no doubt they suit you best although they woo you roughly it is said their way of courtship is a blow struck with a nuller on the head it doesn't hurt you much the thing is hardly novel to your life and sans the feast and marriage ring you make a good impromptu wife this hasty sort of wedding might in other cases bring distress but then your draper's bills are light you're frugal in regard to dress you have no passion for the play or park or other showy scenes and hence you have no scores to pay and live within your husband's means of course his income isn't large and not too certain still you thrive by steering well inside the marge and keep your little ones alive in short in some respects you set a fine example and a few of those white matrons i have met would show some sense by copying you here let us part i will not say o oh lady free from sense and starch that you are like in any way the authoress of middlemarch one cannot match her perfect phrase with commonplaces from your lip and yet there are some sexual traits that show your dim relationship indeed in spite of all the mists that grow from social codes i see the liberal likeness which exists throughout our whole humanity and though i've laughed at your expense o dryad of the dusky race no man who has a heart and sense would bring displeasure to your face end of poem this recording is in the public domain Hi Brazil by Henry Kendall Read for LibriVox.org by Nemo Daughter, said the ancient father, pausing by the evening sea, turn thy face towards the sunset, turn thy face and kneel with me. Prayer and praise and holy fasting, lips of love and life of light, these and these have made thee perfect, shining saint with seraph's sight. Look towards that flaming crescent, look beyond that glowing space. Tell me, sister of the angels, what is beaming in thy face? And the daughter who had fasted, who had spent her days in prayer, till the glory of the Saviour touched her head and rested there turned her eyes toward the sea-line saw beyond the fiery crest floating over waves of jasper far high brazil in the west all the calmness and the color all the splendor and repose flowing where the sunset flowered like a silver-hearted rose there indeed was singing eden where the great gold river runs past the porch in gates of crystal ringed by strong and shining ones there indeed was god's own garden sailing down the sapphire sea lawny dells and slopes of summer dazzling stream and radiant tree out against the hushed horizon out beneath the reverent day flamed the wonder on the waters flamed and flashed and passed away and the maiden who had seen it felt a hand within her own and an angel that we know not led her to the lands unknown never since hath i beheld it never since hath mortal dazed by its strange unearthly splendor on the floating eden gazed only once since Eve went weeping through a throng of glittering wings, 
hath the holy seen high Brazil, where the great gold river sings. Only once by quiet waters, under still resplendent skies, did the sister of the seraphs kneel in sight of paradise. She, the pure, the perfect woman, sanctified by patient prayer, had the eyes of saints of heaven, all their glory in her hair. Therefore God the Father whispered to a radiant spirit near, Show our daughter fair high Brazil, show her this, and lead her here. But beyond the halls of sunset, but within the wondrous west, on the rose-red seas of evening, sails the garden of the blest. Still the gates of glassy beauty, still the walls of glowing light, shine on waves that no man knows of, out of sound and out of sight. Yet the slopes and lawns of luster, yet the dells of sparkling streams, dip to tranquil shores of jasper, where the watching angel beams. But, behold, our eyes are human, and our way is paved with pain. We can never find high Brazil, never see its hills again, never look on bays of crystal, never bend the reverent knee in the sight of Eden floating, floating on the sapphire sea. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Jim the Splitter by Henry Kendall Read for LibriVox.org by Nima The bard who is singing of Wallum by Jim is hardly just now in the requisite trim to sit on his pegasus fairly. Besides, he is bluntly informed by the muse that Jim is a subject no singer should choose, for Jim is poetical rarely. But being full up of the myths that are Greek, of the classic and noble and nude and antique, which means not a rag but the pelton, this poet intends to give Daphne the slip for the sake of a hero in moleskin and kip, with a jumper and snake buckle belt on. No party is Jim of the Pericles type, he is modern right up from the toe to the pipe, and being no reader or roamer, he hasn't Euripides much in the head, and let it be carefully tenderly said, he never has analyzed Homer. He can roar out a song of the twopenny kind, but knowing the beggar so well I'm inclined to believe that a par about Kelly. The rascal who skulked under shadow of curse is more in his line than the happiest verse on the glittering pages of Shelley. You mustn't, however, judge him in haste, because a red robber is more to his taste than Ruskin, Rossetti, or Dante. You see, he was bred in a bangalow wood, and bangalow pith was the principal food his mother served out in her shanty. His knowledge is this he can tell in the dark what timber will split by the feel of the bark and rough as his manner of speech is. His wits to the fore he can readily bring, and passing off ash is the genuine thing, when scarce in the forest the beeches. In girthing a tree that he sells in the round, he assumes as a rule that the body is sound, and measures for getting to bark it. He may be a ninny, but still the old dog can plug to perfection the pipe of a log, and palm it away on the market. He splits a fair shingle, but holds to the rule of his father's and happily his grandfather's school, which means that he never has blundered, when tying his shingles by slinging in more than the recognized number of ninety and four, to the bundle he sells for a hundred. When asked by the market for iron bark red, it always occurs to the wallum by head to do a mahogany swindle. In forest where never the iron bark grew, when Jim is at work it would flabbergast you to see how the iron barks dwindle. He can stick to the saddle, can wall him by Jim, and when a buck jumper dispenses with him, the leather goes off with a rider. And as to a team over gully and hill, he can travel with twelve on the breath of a quill, and boss the unlucky offsider. He shines at his best at the tiller of saw, on top of the pit where his whisper is law, to the gentleman working below him. When the pair of them pause in a circle of dust, like a monarchy poses exalted august. There's nothing this planet can show him. For a man is a man who can sharpen and set, and he is the only thing masculine yet, according to Sawyer and Splitter. 
or rather according to wallen by jim and nothing will tempt me to differ from him for jim is bit of a hitter but being full up will allow him to rip along of his lingo his saw and his whip he isn't the classical notion and after a night in his humpy you see a person of orthodox habits would be refreshed by a dip in the ocean to tot him right up from heel to the head he isn't the grecian of whom we have read his face is a trifle too shady the nymph in green valleys of thessaly dim would never jack up her old lover for him for she has the taste of a lady so much for our hero a statuous foot would suffer by wearing that heavy nailed boot its owner is hardly achilles however he's happy he cuts a great fig in the land where a coat is no part of the rig in the country of damper and billies End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Mooney by Henry Kendall, read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson. Written in the shadow of 1872. Ah, to be by Mooney now, where the great dark hills of wonder, scarred with storm and cleft asunder by the strong sword of the thunder make a night on morning's brow just to stand where nature's face is flushed with power in forest places where of god authentic trace is ah to be by mooney now just to be by mooney springs there to stand the shining sharer of that larger life and rarer beauty caught from beauty fairer than the human face of things soul of mine from sin abhorrent fain would hide by flashing current like a sister of the torrent far away by mooney springs he that is by mooney now sees the water sapphires gleaming where the river spirit dreaming sleeps by fall and fountain streaming under lute of leaf and bough hears where stamp of storm with stress is psalms from unseen wildernesses deep amongst far hill recesses he that is by mooney now yea for him by mooney's marge sings the yellow-haired september with the face of god's remember when the ridge is burnt to ember and the dumb sea chains the barge where the mount like molten brass is down beneath fern feathered passes noonday dew in cool green grasses gleams on him by mooney's marge who that dwells by mooney yet feels in flowerful forest arches smiting wings and breath that parches where strong summer's path of march is and the sun's in thunder set house beneath the gracious kirtle of the shadowy water myrtle winds may hiss with heat and hurtle he is safe by mooney yet days there were when he who sings dumb so long though passion's losses stood where mooney's water crosses shining tracts of green-haired mosses like a soul with radiant wings then the psalm the wind rehearses then the song the stream disperses lent a beauty to his verses who to-night of mooney sings ah the theme the sad gray theme certain days are not above me certain hearts have ceased to love me certain fancies fail to move me like the affluent morning dream head whereon the white is stealing heart whose hurts are past all healing where is now the first pure feeling ah the theme the sad gray theme sin and shame have left their trace he who mocks the mighty gracious love of christ with eyes audacious hunting after fires fallacious where is the issue in his face soul that flotteth gift and giver like the broken persian river thou hast lost thy strength for ever sin and shame have left their trace in the years that used to be when the large supreme occasion brought the life of inspiration like a god's transfiguration was the shining change in me then where mooney's glory glances clear diviner countenances beamed on me like blessed chances in the years that used to be ah the beauty of old ways then the man who so resembled lords of light unstained unhumbled touched the skirts of christ nor trembled at the grand benignant gaze 
now he shrinks before the splendid face of deity offended and the loveliness is ended all the beauty of old ways still to be by moony cool where the water blossoms glister and by gleaming vale and vista sits the english april's sister soft and sweet and wonderful just to rest beyond the burning outer world it sneers and spurning ah my heart my heart is yearning still to be by moony cool now by moony's fair hill heads lo the gold green lights are glowing where because no wind is blowing fancy hears the flowers growing in the herby watershed faint it is the sound of thunder from the torrents far thereunder where the meeting mountains ponder now by moony's fair hill heads just to be where moony is even where the fierce fall races down a gust unfathomed places where of sun or moon no trace is and the streams of shadows hiss have i not an ample reason so to long for sick of treason something of the grand old season just to be where moony is end of poem this recording is in the public domain Pythias by Henry Kendall, read for LibriVox.org by Nemo. Gaul, whose keel and far dim ages ploughed wan wits of polar sea, gray old sailor of Massalia, who hath woven wreath for thee, who amongst the world's high singers ever breathed the tale sublime of the man who coasted England in the misty dawn of time, leaves of laurel lights of music these and these have never shed glory on the name unheard of lustre on the vanished head lords of song and these are many never yet have raised the lay for the white wind-beaten seamen of a wild forgotten day harp of shining son of godhead still is as a voice august but the man who first saw britain sleeps beneath unnoticed dust from the fair calm bays hellenic from the crescents and the bends round the wall of crystal athens glowing in gold evening ends sailed abroad the grand strong father with his face towards the snow of the awful northern mountains twenty centuries ago on the seas that none have heard of by the shores where none have furled wing of canvas, past this elder to the limits of the world. Lurid limits, loud with thunder and the roar of flaming cone, ghastly tracks of ice and whirlwind lying in a dim, blind zone, bitter belts of naked region, girt about by cliffs of fear, where the spirit of the darkness dwells in heaven half the year. Yea, against the wild weird tule steered the stranger through the gates opened by a fire eternal into tempest trampled straits tule lying like a nightmare on the borders of the pole neither land nor air nor water but a mixture of the whole dumb dead chaos gray as spectre now a mist and now a cloud where the winds cry out for ever and the wave is always loud here the lord of many waters in the great exalted years saw the sight that no man knows of heard the sound that no man hears felt that god was in the shadow ere he turned his prow and sped to the sweet green fields of england with the sunshine overhead in the day when pallid persia fled before the thracian steel by the land that now is london past the strange hellenic keel up the bends of quiet river hard by banks of grove and flower sailed the father through a silence in the old majestic hour not a sound of fin or feather not a note of wave or breeze vexed the face of sleeping streamlets 
broke the rest of stirless trees. Not a foot was in the forest, not a voice was in the wood. When the elder from Massalia over English waters stood, all was new and hushed and holy, all was pure untrodden space. When the lord of many oceans turned to it a reverent face, man who knew resplendent Athens set and framed in silver sea did not dream a dream of england england of the years to be friend of fathers like to plato bards august in hallowed seers did not see that tenfold glory britain of the future years spirit filled with grecian music songs that charm the dark away on that large supreme occasion did not note diviner lay did not hear the voice of shakespeare all the mighty life was still down the slopes that dipped to seaward on the shoulders of the hill but the gold and green were brighter than the bloom of thracian springs and a strange surpassing beauty shone upon the face of things in a grave that no man thinks of back from far forgotten bays sleeps the gray wind-beaten sailor of the old exalted days he that coasted wales and dover he that first saw sussex plains passed away with head unlaurelled in the wild thessalian rains in a space by hand untended by a fen of vapours blind lies the king of many waters out of sight and out of mind no one brings the yearly blossom no one calls the flower of grace for the shell of mighty father buried in that lonely place but the winds are low and holy and the songs of sweetness flow where he fell asleep forever twenty centuries ago and a poem this recording's in the public domain Bill the Bullock Driver by Henry Kendall Read for LibriVox.org by Nemo The leaders of millions, the lords of the lands, Who sway the wide world with their will, And shake the great globe with the strength of their hands, Flash past us unnoticed by Bill. The elders of science who measure the spheres, And weigh the vast bulk of the sun, Who see the grand lights beyond eons of years, Are less than a bullock to one. The singers that sweeten all time with their song, pure voices that make us forget, humanity's drama of marvelous wrong, to Bill are his mysteries yet. By thunders of battle and nations uphurled, Bill's sympathies never were stirred. The helmsmen who stand at the wheel of the world, by him are unknown and unheard. What trouble has Bill for the ruin of lands, or the quarrels of temple and throne? so long as the whip that he holds in his hands and the team that he drives are his own. As straight and as sound as slab without crack, our Bill is a king in his way, though he camps by the side of a shingle track and sleeps on the bed of his dray. A whip lashed to him is as dear as a rose would be to a delicate maid. He carries his darlings wherever he goes and a pocketbook tattered and frayed. The joy of a bard when he happens to write a song like the song of his dream is nothing at all to our hero's delight and the pluck and the strength of his team for the kings of the earth for the faces august of princes the millions may shout to bill as he lumbers along in the dust a bullock's the grandest thing out his four-footed friends are the friends of his choice no lover is bill of your dames but the cattle that turn at the sound of his voice have the sweetest of features and names a father's chief joy is a favorite son when he reaches some eminent goal but the pride of bill's heart is the hairy-legged one that pulls with a will at the pole his dray is no living responsible thing but he gives it the gender of life and seeing his fancy is free in the wing it suits him as well as a wife he thrives like an arab between the two wheels in his bedroom where lying up curled 
He thinks for himself like a sultan and feels that his home is the best in the world. For even though cattle, like subjects, will break, at times from the yoke and the band, Bill knows how to act when his rule is at stake, and is therefore a lord of the land. Of course he must dream, but be sure that his dreams, if happy, must compass, alas, fat bullocks that feed by improbable streams, knee-deep in improbable grass. No poet is Bill for the visions of night, to him are his visions of day, and the pipe that in sleep he endeavors to light is the pipe that he smokes on the dray. To the mighty magnificent temples of God in the hearts of the dominant hills, Bill's eyes are as blind as the fire black and clod that burns far away from the rills. Through beautiful, bountiful forests that screen a marvel of blossoms from heat, whose lights are the mellowing golden and green, Bill walked with irreverent feet. The manifold splendors of mountain and wood by Bill like non-entities slip. He loves the black myrtle because it is good as a handle to lash to his whip. And thus through the world, with a swing in his tread, our hero self-satisfied goes, with his cabbage tree hat on the back of his head and the string of it under his nose. Poor bulky Bill, in the circle select of the scholars, he hasn't a place, but he walks like a man with his forehead erect, and he looks at God's day in the face. For rough as he seems, he would shudder to wrong a dog with the loss of a hair. And the angels of shine and superlative song see his heart and the deity there. Few know him indeed, but the beauty that glows in the forest is loveliness still. And Providence helping the life of the rose is a friend and a father to Bill. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Turin Bean by Henry Hendel Read for LibriVox.org by Algie Pug Years fifty and seven to boot Have smitten the children of men Since sound of a voice or a foot Came out of the head of that glen. The brand of black devil is there, An evil wind moaneth around. There is doom, there is death in the air, A curse groweth up from the ground. No noise of the axe or the saw in that hollow unholy is heard. No fall of the hoof or the paw, no whir of the wing of the bird. But a grey mother down by the sea, as wan as the foam on the strait, has counted the beads on her knee these forty-nine winters and eight. Whenever an elder is asked, a white-headed man of the woods, of the terrible mystery masked where the dark everlastingly broods. Be sure he will turn to the bay with his back to the glen in the range and glide like a phantom away with a countenance pallid with change. From the line of dead timber that lies supine at the foot of the glade the fierce-featured eagle-hawk flies, afraid as a dove is afraid. But back in that wilderness dread are a fall on the forks of a ford. Ah, pray and uncover your head, and lean like a child on the Lord. A sinister fog at the wane, and the change of the moon cometh forth like an ominous ghost in the train of a bitter black storm of the north. For the head of the gully unknown, it hangs like a spirit of bale. And the noise of a shriek and a groan strikes up in the gusts of the gale. In the throat of a feculent pit is the beard of a bloody red sedge, And a foam like the foam of a fit sweats out of the lips of the ledge. But down in the water of death, in the livid dead pool at the base, Bow low, with inaudible breath, beseech with the hands to the face, a furlong of fetid black fen with gelid green patches of pond lies dumb by the horns of the glen at the gates of the horror beyond and those who have looked on it tell of the terrible growths that are there the flowerage fostered by hell the blossoms that startle and scare if ever a wandering bird should light on gehennas like this be sure that a cry will be heard and the sound of the flat adder's hiss. 
but hard by the jaws of the bend is a ghastly thing matted with moss ah lord be a father a friend for the sake of the christ of the cross black tom with the sinews of five that never a hangman could hang in the days of the shackle and gyve broke loose from the guards of the gang thereafter for seasons a score this devil proud under the ban a mate of red talon and poor a wolf in the shape of a man but ringed by ineffable fire in a thunder and wind of the north the sword of omnipotent ire the bolt of high heaven went forth but wan as the sorrowful foam a grey mother waits by the sea for the boys that have never come home these fifty-four winters and three from the folds of the forested hills there are rabbled and roundabout tracks because of the terror that fills the strong-handed men of the axe of the workers away in the range there is none that will wait for the night when the storm-stricken moon is in change and the sinister fog is in sight but later and deep in the dark when the bitter wind whistles about there is never a howl or a bark from the dog in the kennel without but the white fathers fasten the door and often and often they start at a sound like a foot on the floor and a touch like a hand on the heart end of poem this recording is in the public domain We're Underneath the Brown Dead Grass by Henry Kendall, read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson. When underneath the brown dead grass my weary bones are laid, I hope I shall not see the glass at ninety in the shade. I trust indeed when I lie beneath the churchyard pine, I shall not hear that startling cry, Their mom's is ninety nine. If one should whisper through my sleep, Come up and be alive, I'd answer, No, unless you'll keep the glass at sixty-five. I might be willing, if allowed, To wear old Adam's rig, And mix amongst the city crowd Like Polynesian nig. Far better in the sod to lie With pasturing pig above Than broil beneath a copper sky In sight of all I love. Far better to be turned to grass to feed the pulley cow than to be half boiled bream, alas, that I am really now. For cow and pig I would not hear, and hoof I would not see, but if these items did appear, they wouldn't trouble me. For ah, the pelt of mortal man weighs less than half a ton, and any sight is better than a sultry southern sun. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Voice and the Wild Oak by Henry Kendall Read for LibriVox.org by Nemo Written in the shadow of 1872 Twelve years ago, when I could face high heaven's dome with different eyes, in days full-flowered with hours of grace, and nights not sad with sighs, I wrote a song in which I strove to shadow forth thy strain of woe, dark widowed sister of the grove twelve wasted years ago. But youth was then too young to find those high authentic syllables whose voice is like the wintering wind by sunless mountain fells. Nor had I sinned and suffered then to that superlative degree that I would rather seek than men wild fellowship with thee but he who hears this autumn day thy more than deep autumnal rhyme is one whose hair was shot with gray by grief instead of time he has no need like many a bard to sing imaginary pain because he bears and finds it hard the punishment of cain no more he sees the affluence which makes the heart of nature glad for he has lost the fine first sense of beauty that he had. The old delight God's happy breeze was wont to give, the grief has grown, and therefore, Niobe of trees, his song is like thine own. But I, who am that perished soul, have wasted so these powers of mine, 
that I can never write that whole, pure, perfect speech of thine. Some lord of words, august supreme, the grave, grand melody demands. The dark translation of thy theme I leave to other hands. Yet here, where plovers nightly call across dim, melancholy lees, where comes by whistling fen and fall the moan of far-off seas. A gray, old fancy often sits beneath thy shade with tired wings and fills thy strong, strange rhythm by fits with awful utterings. Then times there are when all the words are like the sentences of one shut in by fate from the wind and birds and light of stars and sun. No dazzling dryad, but a dark, dream-haunted spirit doomed to be imprisoned, cramped in bands of bark for all eternity. Yea, like the speech of one aghast at immortality in chains, what time the lordly storm rides past with flames and arrowy rains, some wan tithonus of the wood, white with immeasurable years, an awful ghost in solitude with moaning, moors and mirrors, and when high thunder smites the hill and hunts the wild dog to his den, thy cries like malediction shrill and shriek from glen to glen, as if a frightful memory whipped thy soul for some infernal crime that left it blasted, blind, and stripped, a dread to death and time. But when the fair-haired August dies and flowers wax strong and beautiful, Thy songs are stately harmonies by woodlights green and cool, most like the voice of one who shows through sufferings fierce and fine relief, a noble patience and repose, a dignity in grief. But, ah, conceptions fade away, and still the life that lives in thee, the soul of thy majestic lay, remains a mystery. And he must speak the speech divine, the language of the high-throned lords, who'd give that grand old theme of thine its sense in faultless words. By hollow lands and sea tracks harsh, with rune of the fourfold gale, where sighs the sedge and sobs the marsh, still wail thy lonely wail. And, year by year, one step will break the sleep of far hill folded streams, and seek, if only for thy sake, thy home of many dreams. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Billy Vickers by Henry Kendall. Read for LibriVox.org by Nemo. No song is this of leaf and bird and gracious waters flowing. I'm sick at heart, for I have heard Big Billy Vickers blowing. He'd never take a leading place in chambers legislative, this booby with a vacant face, this haughty dotty native. Indeed, I'm forced to say aside to you, O oh reader, solely, he only wants the horns and hide to be a bullock holy. But, like all noodles, he is vain, and when his tongue is wagging, I feel inclined to copy Cain and drop him for his bragging. He, being bushbred, stands, of course, six feet, his dirty socks in. His lingo is confined to horse and plough and pig and oxen. Two years ago he'd less to say, within his little circuit, but now he has, besides a dray, a team of twelve to work it. No wonder is it that he feels inclined to clack and rattle. About his bullocks and his wheels, he owns a dozen cattle. In short, to be exact and blunt, in his own estimation, he's out and out, the head and front, top sawyer of creation. For, mark me, he can sit a buck for hours and hours together, and never horse has had the luck to pitch him from the leather. If ever he should have a spill upon the grass or gravel, 
be sure of this the saddle will with billy vickers travel at punching oxen you may guess there's nothing out can camp him he has in fact the slouch and dress which bullock driver stamp him i do not mean to give offence but i have vainly striven to ferret out the difference twixt driver and the driven of course the statements herein made in every other stanza are billy's own and i'm afraid they're stark extravaganza i feel constrained to treat his trash as noisy fiddle-faddle about his doings with the lash his feats upon the saddle but grant he knows his way about or grant that he is silly there cannot be the slightest doubt of billy's faith in billy of all the doings of the day his ignorance is utter but he can quote the price of hay the current rate of butter his notions of our leading men are mixed in misty vary he knows a cochin china hen he never speaks of berry as you'll assume he hasn't heard of madam patty singing but i will stake my solemn word he knows what maize is bringing surrounded by majestic peaks by lordly mountain ranges where the highest voice of thunder speaks his aspect never changes the grand pacific there beyond his dirty hut is glowing he only sees a big salt pond o'er which his grain is going the sea that covers half the sphere with all its stately speeches is held by bill to be a mere broad highway for his peaches through nature's splendid temples he plods under mountains hoary but he has not the eyes to see their grandeur and their glory a bullock in a biped's boot i iterate is billy he crushes with a careless foot the touching water lily i've said enough i'll let him go if he could read these verses he'd pepper me four hours i know with his peculiar curses but this is sure he'll never change his manners loud and flashy nor learn with neatness to arrange his clothing cheap and trashy like other louts he'll jog along and swig at shanty liquors and chew and spit here ends the song of mr billy vickers and a poem this recording is in the public domain persia by henry kendall read for LibriVox.org by larry wilson i am writing this song at the close of a beautiful day of the spring in a dell where the daffodil grows by a grove of the glimmering wing from glades where a musical word comes over from luminous fall i send you the song of a bird that i wish to be dear to you all i have given my darling the name of a land at the gates of the day where morning is always the same and spring never passes away with a prayer for a lifetime of light i christened her persia you see and i hope that some fathers to-night will kneel in spirit with me she is only commencing to look at the beauty in which she is set and forest and flower and brook to her are all mysteries yet i know that to many my words will seem insignificant things but you who are mothers of birds will feel for the father who sings for all of you doubtless have been where sorrows are many and wild and you know what a beautiful scene of this world can be made by a child i am sure if they listen to this sweet women will quiver and long to tenderly stoop to and kiss the persia i have put in a song and i am certain the critic will pause and excuse for the sake of my bird my sins against critical laws the slips in the thought and the word and haply some dear little face of his own to his mind will occur some persia who brightens his place and i'll be forgiven for her a life that is turning to gray has hardly been happy you see but the rose that has dropped on my way is morning and music to me yea she that i hold in the hand is changing white winter to green and making a light of the land all fathers will know what i mean all women and men who have known the sickness of sorrow and sin 
will feel having babes of their own my verse and the pathos therein for that must be touching which shows how a life has been led from the wild to a garden of glitter and rose by the flower-like hand of a child she is strange to this wonderful sphere one summer and winter have set since god left her radiance here her sweet second year is not yet the world is so lovely and new to eyes full of eloquent light and sisters i'm hoping that you will pray for my persia to-night for i who have suffered so much and know what the bitterness is am sad to think sorrow must touch some day even darlings like this but sorrow is part of this life and therefore a father doth long for the blessing of mother and wife on the bird he has put in a song End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Lilith by Henry Kendall. Read for LibriVox.org by Kirby Wheatland. Strange is the song, and the soul that is singing falters because of the vision it sees. Voice that is not of the living is ringing down in the depths where the darkness is clinging, even when noon is the lord of the lees, fast like a curse to the ghosts of the trees. Here in a mist that is parted in sunder, half with the darkness and half with the day, face of a woman, but face of a wonder, vivid and wild as a flame of the thunder, flashes and fades and the wail of the gray water is loud on the straits of the bay father whose years have been many and weary elder whose life is as lovely as light shining in ways that are sterile and dreary tell me the name of this beautiful peri flashing on me like the wonderful white star at the meeting of morning and night look to thy savior and down on thy knee man Lean on the Lord, as the Zebedee leaned. Daughter of hell is the neighbor of thee, man. Lilith of Adam is the luminous leman. Turn to the Christ to be succored and screened, Saved from the eyes of a marvelous fiend. Serpent is she in the shape of a woman, Brighter than woman, ineffably fair. Shelter thyself from the splendor, and sue, man, Light that was never a loveliness human lives in the face of this sinister snare, longing to strangle thy soul with her hair. Lilith, who came to the father and bound him, fast with her eyes in the first of the springs, Lilith she is, but remember she drowned him, shedding her flood of gold tresses round him, lulled him to sleep with the lyric she sings, melody strange with unspeakable things. Low is her voice, but beware of it ever, Swift, bitter death is the fruit of delay. Never was song of its beauty, ah, never, heard on the mountain, or meadow, or river. Not of the night is it, not of the day. Fly from it, stranger, away and away. Back on the hills are the blossom and feather. Glory of noon is on valley and spire. Here is the grace of magnificent weather. Where is the woman from gulfs of the nether? Where's the fiend with the face of desire? Gone with a cry in miraculous fire. Sound that was not of this world or the spacious, splendid blue heaven has passed from the lee. Dead is the voice of the devil audacious. Only a dream is her music fallacious. Here in the song and the shadow of tree, down by the green and the gold of the sea. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Bob by Henry Kindle, read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson. Singer of songs of the hills, dreamer by waters unstirred, back in a valley of rills, home of the leaf and the bird. Read in this fall of the year just the compassionate phrase, faded with traces of tear written in far-away days gone is the light of my lamp lord at thy bidding i bow here is my little one's cap he has no need of it now give it to somebody's boy somebody's darling she wrote 
touching was bob in his joy bob without boots or a coat only a cap but it gave capless and comfortless one happiness bright as the brave beautiful light of the sun soft may the sanctified sod rest on the father who led bob from the gutter unshod covered his cold little head bob from the foot to the crown measured a yard and no more baby alone in the town homeless and hungry and sore child that was never a child hiding away from the rain draggled and dirty and wild down in a pipe of the drain poor little beggar was bob couldn't afford to be sick getting a penny a job sometimes a curse and a kick father was killed by the drink mother was driven to shame bob couldn't manage to think he had forgotten their name god was in heaven above flowers illumined the ground women of infinite love lived in the palaces round saints with the character sweet found in the fathers of old labored in alley and street baby slept out in the cold nobody noticed the child nobody knew of the might creeping about like a wild thing in the shadow of night beaten by drunkards and cowed frightened to speak or to sob how could he ask you aloud have you a penny for bob few were the pennies he got seldom could he hide them away watched by the ravenous sot ever at wait for his prey poor little man he would weep oft for a morsel of bread coppers he wanted to keep went to the tavern instead this was his history friend ragged unhoused and alone how could the child comprehend love that he had never known hunted about in the world crouching in crevices dim crust with a curse at him hurled stood for a kindness with him little excited his joy but after doing a job mother of bright-headed boy think of the motherless bob high in the heavens august provident saw him and said out of the pits of the dust lift him and cover his head ah the ineffable grace father of children in thee boy in a radiant place fanned by the breeze of the sea child on a lullaby lap said in the pause of his pain mother don't bury my cap give it to bob in the lane beautiful bidding of death what could she do but obey even when suffering faith hadn't the power to pray so in the fall of the year saint with the fatherly head hunted for somebody's dear somebody's darling he said bob who was nobody's child sitting on nobody's lap draggled and dirty and wild but got the little one's cap strange were compassionate words waif of the alley and lane dreamed of the music of birds floating about in the rain white-headed father and god over thy beautiful grave green is the grass of the sod soft is the sound of the wave down by the slopes of the sea often and often will sob boy who was fostered by thee this is the story of bob end of poem this recording is in the public domain peter the piccaninny by henry kendall read for librivox dot org by algy pug he has a name which can't be brought within the sphere of meter but as he's peter by report i'll trot him out as peter i call him mine but don't suppose that i'm his dad o oh reader my wife has got a norman nose she reads the tales of weeder i never loved a nigger belle my tastes are too aesthetic the perfume from a gin is well a rather strong emetic but seeing that my theme is pete this verse will be the neater if i keep on the proper beat and stick throughout to peter we picked him up the lord knows where at noon we came across him asleep beside a hunk of bear his paunch was bulged with possum la stanza will not bear i own a pressure analytic but barred whose weight is fourteen stone is apt to thump the critic we asked the kid to give his name he didn't seem too willing the darkie played the darkie's game 
we tipped him with a shilling we tipped him with a shining bob no tommy dodd believe us we didn't tumble to his job ah why did pete deceive us i being as i've said a bard resolved at once to foster this mite whose length was just a yard this portable impostor this babe i spoke in wordsworth's tone see wordsworth's lucy neighbour i'll make a darling of my own and he'll repay my labour you'll grow as gentle as a fawn as quiet as the blossoms that beautify a land of lawn he'll eat no more opossums this child i to myself will take in a paternal manner he will not swallow snake in future or goanna will you reside with me my dear i asked in accents mellow the nigger grinned from ear to ear and said all right old feller and so my pete was taken home my pretty piccaninny and not to speak of soap or comb his cleansing cost a guinea but hang expenses i exclaimed i'll give him education a nigger's better when he's tamed perhaps than our caucasian ethnologists are in the wrong about our sable brothers and i intend to stop the song of pickering and others alas i didn't do it though old pickering's conclusions were to the point as issues show and mine were mere delusions my inky pet was clothed and fed for months exceeding forty but to the end it must be said his ways were very naughty when told about the land of morn above this world of mammon he'd shout with an emphatic scorn ah gammon 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 he never lingered like the bard to sniff at rose expanding me like he said em cattle yard fine smell de smell of branding the soul of man i tried to show went up beyond our vision you ever see that fellow go he asked in sheer derision in short it soon occurred to me this kid of six or seven who wouldn't learn his abc was hardly ripe for heaven he never lost his appetite he bigger grew and bigger and proved with every inch of height a nigger is a nigger and looking from this moment back i have a strong persuasion that after all a finished black is not the clean caucasian dear peter from my threshold went one morning in the body he dropped me to oblige a gent a gent with spear and waddy he shelled me for a boomerang we never had a quarrel and if a moral here doth hang why let it hang the moral my mournful tale its course has run my pete when last i spied him was eating possum underdone he had his gin beside him end of poem this recording is in the public domain narrer creek by henry kendall read for LibriVox.org by nemo written in the shadow of 1872 from the raining hill heads where in starts and in spasms leaps wild the white torrent from chasm to chasms from the home of bold echoes whose voices of wonder fly out of blind caverns struck black by high thunder through gorges august in whose nether recesses is heard the far psalm of unseen wildernesses like a dominant spirit a strong-handed sharer of spoil with the tempest comes down the narrer yea where the great sword of the hurricane cleaveth the forested fells that the dark never leaveth by fierce featured crags in whose evil abysses the clammy snake coils and the flat adder hisses past lordly rock temples where silence is riven by the anthem supreme of the four winds of heaven it speeds with a cry of the streams of the fountains it chained to its sides and dragged down from the mountains but when it goes forth from the slopes with a sally being strengthened with tribute from many a valley 
it broadens and brightens, and thereupon marches above the stream sapphires and under green arches, with a rhythm of majesty, careless of cumber, its might and repose, and its fierceness and slumber, till it beams on the plains where the wind is a bearer of words from the sea to the stately Nerera. Nerera, grandson of the haughty hill torrent, too late in my day have I looked at thy current, too late in my life to discern and inherit the soul of thy beauty, the joy of thy spirit. With the years of the youth and the hairs of the hoary, I sit like a shadow outside of thy glory, nor look with the morning-like feelings, O river, that illumined the boy in the days gone for ever. Ah, sad are the sounds of old ballads which borrow one half of their grief from the listener's sorrow, and sad are the eyes of the pilgrim who traces the runes of time in revisited places. But sadder than all is the sense of his losses that cometh to one when a sudden age crosses and cripples his manhood. So, stricken by fate, I felt older at thirty than some do at eighty. Because I believe in the beautiful story, the poem of Greece and the days of her glory, that the high-seated lord of the woods and the waters has peopled his world with his deified daughters. That flowerful forest and waterways streaming are gracious with goddesses glowing and gleaming. I pray that thy singing divinity, fairer than wonderful women, may listen nerer. O spirit of sea-going currents, thou being the child of immortals, all-knowing, all-seeing, thou hast at thy heart the dark truth that I borrow for the song that I sing thee, no fanciful sorrow. In the sight of thine eyes is the history written of love smitten down as the strong leaf is smitten, and before thee there goeth a phantom beseeching for faculties forfeited, hopes beyond reaching. Thou knowest, O sister of deities, blazing with splendor ineffable, beauty amazing, what life the gods gave me, what largest I tasted, the youth thrown away, and the faculties wasted. I might, as thou seest, have stood in high places, instead of in pits where the brand of disgrace is. A byword for scoffers, a butt and a caution, with a grave of poor Burns, and Magin for my portion. But the heart of the Father Supreme is offended, and my life in the light of his favor is ended. And, whipped by inflexible devils, I shiver with a hollow too late in my hearing forever. But thou, being sinless, exalted, supernal, the daughter of diademed gods, the eternal, shalt shine in thy waters when time and existence have dwindled like stars in unspeakable distance. But the face of thy river, the torrented power that smites at the rock while it fosters the flower, shall gleam in my dreams with the summer look splendid, and the beauty of woodlands and waterfalls blended. And often I'll think of far forested noises and the emphasis deep of grand sea-going voices, and turn to Nerera the eyes of a lover, when the sorrowful days of my singing are over. End a poem. This recording is in the public domain. In Memory of John Fairfax by Henry Kendall 
Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson. Because this man fulfilled his days like one who walks with steadfast gaze, averted from forbidden ways, with lures of fair, false flowerage deep, behold the Lord whose throne is dim with fires of flaming seraphim, the Christ that suffered sent for him. He giveth his beloved sleep. Think not that souls whose deeds august put sin to shame and make them just become at last the helpless dust that wintering winds through wasteland sweep. The higher life within us cries like some fine spirit from the skies. The Father's blessing on us lies. He giveth his beloved sleep. Not human sleep, the fitful rest, with evil shapes of dreams distressed, but perfect quiet, unexpressed by any worldly word we keep. The dim hereafter framed in creeds may not be this, but he who reads our lives sets flowers on wayside weeds, he giveth his beloved sleep. Be sure this hero who has passed the human space, the outer vast, who worked in harness to the last, doth now a hallowed harvest reap. Love sees his grave, nor turns away. The eyes of faith are like the day, and grief has not a word to say. He giveth his beloved sleep. That fair, rare spirit on earth throws a light, which puts to shame the rose, across his grave, because she knows the sun whose ashes it doth keep. And like far music, this is heard. Behold the man who never stirred by word of his an angry word. He giveth his beloved sleep. He earned his place. Within his hands the power which counsels and commands and shapes the social life of lands became a blessing pure and deep. Through thirty years of turbulence our thoughts were sweetened with a sense of his benignant influence. He giveth his beloved sleep. No splendid talents which excite like music, songs or floods of light were his, but rather all those bright calm qualities of soul which reap a mute but certain fine respect, not only from a source elect, but from the hearts of every sect. He giveth his beloved sleep. He giveth his beloved rest, the faithful soul that onward pressed, unswerving from life's east to west, by paths austere and passes steep is past all toil and over death with reverent hands and prayerful breath i plant this flower alive with faith he giveth his beloved sleep end of poem this recording is in the public domain our lewin by henry kendall read for librivox dot org by nemo Araluen, the poet's daughter, who died in infancy. Take this rose, and very gently place it on the tender, deep mosses where our little darling Araluen lies asleep. Put the blossom close to baby, kneel with me, my love, and pray. We must leave the bird we've buried, say goodbye to her today. In the shadow of our trouble, we must go to other lands, and the flowers we have fostered will be left to other hands. Other eyes will watch them growing, other feet will softly tread. Where two hearts are nearly breaking, where so many tears are shed. Bitter is the world we live in, life and love are mixed with pain. We will never see these daisies, never water them again. Ah, the saddest thought in leaving baby in this bush alone is that we have not been able on her grave to place a stone. We have been too poor to do it, but, my darling, never mind. God is in the gracious heavens, and his son and rain are kind. They will dress the spot with beauty. They will make the grasses grow. Many winds will lull our birdie. Many songs will come and go. Here the blue-eyed spring will linger, here the shining month will stay, like a friend by our Lewin, when we two are far away. But beyond the wild, wide waters we will tread another shore. We will never watch this blossom, 
never see it any more. Girl, whose hand at God's high altar in the dear, dead year I pressed, lean your stricken head upon me. This is still your lover's breast. She who sleeps was first and sweetest. None we have to take her place. Empty is the little cradle, absent is the little face. Other children may be given, but this rose beyond recall, but this garland of your girlhood will be the dearest of them all. None will ever our ruin nestle where you used to be, in my heart of hearts, you darling, when the world was new to me. We were young when you were with us, life and love were happy things, to your father and your mother, ere the angels gave you wings. You that sit and sob beside me, you upon whose golden head many rains of many sorrows have from day to day been shed, who, because your love was noble, faced with me the lot austere, ever pressing with its hardship on the man of letters here. Let me feel that you are near me, lay your hand within mine own, you are all I have to live for, now that we are left alone. Three there were, but one is vanished. Sins of mine have made you weep. But forgive your baby's father, now the baby is asleep. Let us go, for night is falling. Leave the darling with her flowers. Other hands will come and tend them. Other friends in other hours. And a poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Sydney International Exhibition by Henry Kendall. Read for LibriVox.org by Algie Pug. The poem which won the prize offered by the proprietors of the Sydney Morning Herald. Now, while Orion, flaming south, doth set a shining foot on hills of wind and wet, Far haughty hills, beyond the fountains cold, And dells of glimmering greenness manifold, While August sings the advent of the spring, And in the calm is heard September's wing, The lordly voice of song I ask of thee, High deathless radiance, crowned Calliope, What, though we never hear the great God's lays, Which made all music the Hellenic days, What, though the face of thy fair heaven Beams still only on the crystal Grecian streams. What though a sky of new strange beauty shines Where no white dryad sings within the pines. Here is a land whose large imperial grace Must tempt thee, goddess, in thine holy place. Here are the hills of peace and plenilune, The hills of morning and the slopes of noon. Here are the waters dear to days of blue, and dark green hollows of the noontide dew. Here lies the harp, by fragrant woodwinds fanned, That waits the coming of thy quickening hand. And shall Australia, framed and set in sea, August with glory, wait in vain for thee? Shall more than Tempe's beauty be unsung, Because its shine is strange, its colours young? No, by the full, live light, which puts to shame the far fair splendours of Thessalian flame, by yonder forest psalm which sinks and swells like that of Phocis, grave with oracles, by deep prophetic winds that come and go where whispering springs of pondering mountains flow, by lute-like leaves and many-languaged caves, where sounds the strong hosanna of the waves, this great new majesty shall not remain unhonoured by the high immortal strain. Soon, soon the music of the southern lyre shall start and blossom with a speech like fire. Soon, soon shall flower and flow in flame divine thy songs, Apollo, and Euterpe, thine. Strong shining sons of Delphicus shall rise with all their father's glory in their eyes. And then shall beam on yonder slopes and springs The light that swims upon the light of things. And therefore, lingering in a land of lawn, I, 
standing here, a singer of the dawn, with gaze upturned to where wan summits lie against the morning flowing up the sky, whose eyes, in dreams of many colours, see a glittering vision of the years to be, do ask of thee, Calliope, one hour of life preeminent with perfect power, that I may leave a song whose lonely rays may shine hereafter from these songless days. For now there breaks across the faint grey range the rose-red dawning of a radiant change, a soft sweet voice as in the valleys deep where darkness droops and sings itself to sleep. The grave mute woods that yet the silence hold of dim dead ages gleam with hints of gold. Yon eastern cape that meets the straitened wave, a twofold tower above the whistling cave, whose strength in thunder shields the gentle lee, and makes a white wrath of a league of sea, now wears the face of peace. And in the bay, the weak spent voice of winter dies away. In every dell there is a whispering wing, on every lawn a glimmer of the spring, by every hill are growths of tender green, on every slope a fair new life is seen, and lo, beneath the morning's blossoming fires, the shining city of a hundred spires, in mists of gold, by countless havens furled, and glad with all the flags of all the world. These are the shores where, in a dream of fear, Cathay saw darkness dwelling half the year. These are the coasts that old fallacious tales chained down with ice and ringed with sleepless gales. This is the land that, in the hour of awe, from Indian peaks the rapt Venetian saw. Here is the long grey line of a strange sea wall that checked the prow of the audacious Gaul, what time he steered towards the southern snow, from zone to zone, four hundred years ago. By yonder gulf, whose marching waters meet the wine-dark currents from the isles of heat, strong sons of Europe, in a far dim year, faced ghastly foes and felt the alien spear. There, in a later dawn, by shipless waves, the tender grasses found forgotten graves. Far in the west, beyond those hills sublime, Dirk Hartog anchored in the olden time. There, by a wild-faced bay, and in a cleft, his shining name the fair-haired Northman left. And, on those broad imperial waters, far beneath the lordly Occidental star, sailed Tasman down a great and glowing space, whose softer lights were like his lady's face. In dreams of her he roved from zone to zone, and gave her lovely name to coasts unknown, and saw, in streaming sunset everywhere, the curious beauty of her golden hair by flaming tracts of tropic afternoon, where in low heavens hangs a fourfold moon. Here, on the tides of a resplendent year, by capes of jasper, came the buccaneer. Then, then, the wild men, flying from the beach, first heard the clear bold sounds of English speech, and then first fell across a southern plain the strong broad shadows of a Saxon train. Near yonder wall of stately cliff that braves the arrogance of congregated waves, the daring son of grey old Yorkshire stood and dreamed in a majestic solitude what time a gentle April shed its showers, aflame with sunset on the Bay of Flowers. The noble seaman who withheld the hand and spared the hector of his native land, the single savage yelling on the beach the dark strange curses of barbaric speech, exalted sailor whose benignant phrase shines full of beauty in these latter days, who met the naked tribes of fiery skies with great divine compassion in his eyes, who died like him of hoary Nazareth that death august the radiant martyr's death, who in the last hour showed the Christian face, whose crumbling beauty shamed the alien race. In peace he sleeps where deep eternal calms lie round the land of heavy-fruited palms. 
lo in that dell behind a singing bar where deep pure pools of glittering waters are beyond a mossy yellow gleaming glade the last of forby sutherland was laid the blue-eyed saxon from the hills of snow who fell asleep a hundred years ago in flowerful shades where gold and green are rife still rests the shell of his forgotten life far far away beneath some northern sky the fathers of his humble household lie but by his lonely grave are sapphire streams and gracious woodlands where the firefly gleams and ever comes across a silver lea the hymn sublime of the eternal sea on that bold hill against a broad blue stream stood arthur philip in a day of dream what time the mists of morning westward rolled and heaven flowered on a bay of gold here in the hour that shines and sounds afar flamed first old england's banner like a star here in a time august with prayer and praise was born the nation of these splendid days and here this land's majestic yesterday of immemorial silence died away where are the woods that ninety summers back stood hoar with ages by the water track where are the valleys of the flashing wing the dim green margins and the glimmering spring where now the warrior of the forest race his glaring war paint and his fearless face the banks of april and the groves of bird the glades of silence and the pools unstirred the gleaming savage and the whistling spear passed with the passing of a wild old year a single torrent singing by the wave a shadowy relic in a mountain cave a ghost of fire in immemorial hills the whittled tree by folded wayside rills the call of bird that hides in hollows far where feet of thunder wings of winter are of all that past these wrecks of wind and rain these touching memories these alone remain what sun is this that beams and broadens west what wonder this in deathless glory dressed what strange sweet harp of highest god took flame and gave this troy its life its light its name what awful lyre of marvellous power and range upraised this ilion wrought this dazzling change no shining singer of hellenic dreams set yonder splendour by the morning streams no god who glimmers in a doubtful sphere shed glory there created beauty here this is the city that our fathers framed these are the crescents by the elders named the human hands of strong heroic men broke down the mountain filled the gaping glen ran streets through swamp built banks against the foam and bent the arch and raised the lordly dome here are the towers that the founders made here are the temples where these romans prayed here stand the courts in which their leaders met here are their homes and here their altars yet here sleep the grand old men whose lives sublime of thought and action shine and sound through time who worked in darkness onward fought their ways to bring about these large majestic days who left their sons the hearts and high desires which built this city of the hundred spires a stately morning rises on the wing the hills take colour and the valleys sing a strong september flames beyond the lea a silver vision on a silver sea a new age cast in a diviner mould comes crowned with lustre zoned and shod with gold what dream is this on lawny spaces set what miracle of dome and minaret what great mute majesty is this that takes the first of morning ere the songbird wakes lo this was built to honour gathering lands by celtic saxon australasian hands these are the halls where all the flags unfurled break into speech that welcomes all the world and lo our friends are here from every zone from isles we dream of and from tracts unknown here are the fathers from the stately space 
where Ireland is, and England's sacred face. Here are the Norsemen, from their strong sea wall, the grave Grand Teuton, and the brilliant Gaul. From green sweet groves the dark-eyed Lusians sail, and proud Iberia leaves the grape-flushed vale. Here are the lords, whose starry banner shines from fierce Magellan to the Arctic pines. Here come the strangers from the gates of day, from hills of sunrise, and from white Cathay. The spicy islands send their swarthy sons, the lofty north its mailed and mighty ones. Venetian keels are floating on our sea, our eyes are glad with radiant Italy. Yea, north and south, and glowing west and east, are gathering here to grace our splendid feast. The chiefs from peaks august with Asian snow, the elders born where regal roses grow, come hither, with the flower of that fair land, that blooms beyond the fiery tracts of sand, where Syrian suns their angry lustres fling, across blind channels of the bygone spring. And on this great auspicious day, the flowers of labour glorify majestic hours. The singing angel from the starry sphere of dazzling science shows his wonders here, and art, the dream-clad spirit, starts and brings from fairyland her strange sweet glittering things. Here are the works man did, what time his face was touched by God in some exalted place. Here glows the splendour, here the marvel wrought when heaven flashed upon the maker's thought. Yea, here are all the miracles sublime, the lights of genius, and the stars of time. And being lifted by this noble noon, Australia broadens like a tropic moon. Her white pure lustre beams across the zones. The nations greet her from their awful thrones. From hence the morning beauty of her name will shine afar like an exceeding flame. Her place will be with mighty lords whose sway controls the thunder and the marching day. Her crown will shine beside the crowns of kings who shape the seasons rule the course of things. The fame of her, across the years to be, will spread like light on a surpassing sea. And, grace with glory, girt with power august, her life will last till all things turn to dust. To thee the face of song is lifted now, O Lord, to whom the awful mountains bow, whose hands, unseen, the tenfold storms control, whose thunders shake the spheres from pole to pole, who from thy highest heaven lookest down, the sea thy footstool, and the sun thy crown, around whose throne the deathless planets sing hosannas to their high eternal king. To thee the soul of prayer this morning turns, with faith that glitters, and with hope that burns, and in the moments of majestic calm that fill the heart in pauses of the psalm, she asks thy blessing for this fair young land that flowers within the hollow of thine hand. She seeks of thee that boon, that gift sublime, the Christian radiance for this hope of time. And thou wilt listen, and thy face will bend to smile upon us, Master, Father, Friend. The Christ to whom pure pleading heart hath crept was human once, and in the darkness wept. The gracious love that helped us long ago will on us like a summer sunrise flow, and be a light to guide the nation's feet on holy paths, on sacred ways and sweet. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Christmas Creek by Henry Kendall, read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson. Phantom streams were in the distance, mocking lights of lake and pool, ghosts of trees of soft green luster, groves of shadows deep and cool. Yea, some devil ran before them, changing skies of brass to blue, setting bloom where curses planted, where a grass blade never grew. Six there were, and high above them glared a wild and wizened sun, 
ninety leagues from where the waters of the singing valleys run there before them there behind them was the great stark stubborn plain where the dry winds hiss for ever and the blind earth moans for rain ringed about by tracts of furnace ninety leagues from stream to tree six there were with wasted faces working northwards to the sea ah the bitter hopeless desert here these broken human wrecks trod the wilds where sand of fire is with the spiteful spinifex toiled through spheres that no bird knows of where with fiery emphasis hell hath stamped its awful mint mark deep on everything that is toiled and thirsted strove and suffered this was where december's breath as a wind of smiting flame is on weird haggard wastes of death this was where a withered moan is the gleam of weak wan star and a thunder full of menace sends its mighty voices far this was where black execrations from some dark tribunal hurled set the brand of curse on all things in the morning of the world one man yielded then another then a lad of nineteen years reeled and fell with english rivers singing softly in his ears english grasses started round him then the grace of sussex lee came and touched him with the beauty of a green land by the sea old world faces thronged about him old world voices spoke to him but his speech was like a whisper and his eyes were very dim in a dream of golden evening beaming on a quiet strand lay the stranger till a bright one came and took him by the hand england vanished died the voices but he heard a holier tone and an angel that we know not led him to the lands unknown six there were but three were taken three were left to struggle still but against the red horizon flamed a horn of brindled hill but beyond the northern skyline past a wall of steep austere lay the land of light and coolness in an april-coloured year courage brothers cried the leader on the slope of yonder peak there are tracts of herb and shadow and channels of the creek so they made one last great effort hailed their beasts through brake and briar set their feet on spurs of furnace grappled spikes and crags of fire fought the stubborn mountain forces smote down naked natural powers till they gazed from thrones of morning on a sphere of streams and flowers out behind them was the desert glaring like a sea of brass here before them were the valleys fair with moonlight coloured grass at their backs were haggard wastelands bickering in a wicked blaze in their faces beamed the waters marching down melodious ways touching was the cool soft lustre over laps of lawn and lea and majestic was the great road morning made across the sea on the sacred day of christmas after seven months of grief rested three of six who started on a bank of moss and leaf rested by a running river in a hushed a holy week and they named the stream that saved them named it fitly christmas creek end of poem this recording is in the public domain Orera by Henry Kendall Read for LibriVox.org by Kirby Wheatland Orera, a tributary of the River Clarence The strong sob of the chafing stream that seaward fights its way Down crags of glitter, dells of gleam, is in the hills today But far and faint a gray-winged form hangs where the wild lights wane the phantom of a bygone storm, a ghost of wind and rain. The soft white feet of afternoon are on the shining meads. The breeze is as a pleasant tune amongst the happy reeds. The fierce, disastrous flying fire that made the great caves ring, and scarred the slope and broke the spire, is a forgotten thing. The air is full of mellow sounds, the wet hill heads are bright, and down the fall of fragrant grounds the deep ways flame with light. 
a rose-red space of stream i see past banks of tender fern a radiant brook unknown to me beyond its upper turn the singing silver life i hear whose home is in the green far-folded woods of fountains clear where i have never been ah brook above the upper bend i often long to stand where you in soft cool shades descend from the untrodden land ah folded woods that hide the grace of moss and torrents strong i often wish to know the face of that which sings your song but i may linger long and look till night is over all my eyes will never see the brook or sweet strange waterfall the world is round me with its heat and toil and cares that tire i cannot with my feeble feet climb after my desire but on the lap of lands unseen within a secret zone there shine diviner gold and green than man has ever known and where the silver waters sing down hushed and holy dells the flower of a celestial spring a tenfold splendor dwells yea in my dream of fall and brook by far sweet forests furled i see that light for which i look in vain through all the world the glory of a larger sky on slopes of hills sublime that speak with god and morning high above the ways of time ah haply in this sphere of change where shadows spoil the beam it would not do to climb that range and test my radiant dream the slightest glimpse of yonder place untrodden and alone might wholly kill that nameless grace the charm of the unknown and therefore though i look and long perhaps the lot is bright which keeps the river of the song a beauty out of sight End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.